I'll do them. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's just me and Melissa on the Zoom tonight. So what we decided <laughs> to do uh, was just talk through it ourselves. Um, key points, throw out some definitions or some connections, cross-references, uh, things for you to know about the basic outline of chapter four. So I'll post this either later tonight or early tomorrow. Y'all can like watch it with your own notes and kind of sit and just listen to it since there's not gonna be a lot of, uh, obviously not a lot of engagement. <laughs> um, so Melissa, why don't you start by talking about, again, about all the things that lead up to understanding the beginning and the flow of this chapter going forward. Okay, so um, kind of like we talked about before with Ephesians 1 through 3 is um, there's a lot of theology in that, a lot of um, trying to think, get my thoughts together here, but basically um, Sorry. defining who we are. Spot. My bad. That's right, but defining who we are in Christ, defining, you know, before the foundation of the world, um, that we fit not only where we fit in his plan, that there is a plan, um, that we can trust his plan. Um, I was looking for, I found something today that said uh, chapters one through three were kind of like a graduation speech. <laughs> I thought that's perfect. It really is. It's like, here's the overview. Here's where, you know, um, it's encouraging. It is um, very deep, very deep. Um, and it's a gospel. And I feel like um, then that leads to, in four, he definitely shifts um, the way he's writing and um, almost an, an urgency, I, I thought, um, but also, um, Hang on, hang on. Da, 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 da. Um, it's more of a, a challenge or an exhortation um, uh, in four through six. So it's how to walk that out. So it's yeah. kind of, now you know who you are, you know that there's a plan. It all starts with the father um, um, and God has loved you from eternity past. And, um, and that is, and then we learn who Christ is and all that in one through three. And then he says, okay, now get to it. Yeah. Um, something I, I read today that I thought was really a great way to like set it up. And it kind of also goes forward a little bit was that uh, that opening line that that really is like the key that I, you know, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called was like, okay, well, the calling was explained in one through three, right? That's your calling. And now he's going to yeah. say, because of that. So exactly what you're saying everything you've learned in one through three because of all of that i've said and explained to you should cause you to therefore do this kind of thing right. and so they were saying one of the key principles was in chapter one he says you know you've been seated in the heavenly places right and that now you need to walk so it's like learn how to be and learn how to sit mm -hmm. i'll learn how to walk and then in chapter six he's going to tell you how to uh battle warfare so it was like uh sit walk stand so mm -hmm. six that stand so it's like you you're learning how to be learn how to sit in christ learn how to walk in christ learn how to stand in christ for the battle and somebody else put it that first of all he shows you the wealth of right. all of the inheritance then he shows you the walk that you walk out because of your inheritance and then he shows you the warfare that comes if you walk out your inheritance. And I loved that progression that it was like wealth, walk, warfare. And I was like, okay, that makes complete sense. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I do think that it's so important as you read these chapters, I find myself when I have Ephesians four out, I have three, two, and one out as well chapters because I just, you have to keep going back and getting the flow of thought that leads to, you know, if you're in chapter three, it's like, I need that flow of thought from two to three. I need that flow of thought from one to two, from two to three, from three to four. So it's like just following, because just like us, if we were to sit down and write a letter, our thoughts are going to come out based on that, you know, a flow of, 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 you know, process that we're thinking through and he's no different. So it's That's really right. important because he's going to go back. I noticed so many in chapter four, as we go through it, we'll see so many callbacks to what he's already said and it's like you'll miss them if you don't think about oh he just said that like right. even the opening line you've been called worthy of the calling you've been called well that 
He just talked yeah. about the calling. What calling? Yeah, that was one of my first questions I was going to ask tonight is what, what do you feel like your calling is? I think so one, um, not problem with Ephesians, I guess, but one way it is, was taught is I feel like um, we just got right to chapter four and <laughs> we didn't talk about one through three and we write right to vocation. Um, and then reading it though, you got to start at the beginning and then it's like, hmm, I think this there's, you know, I, I just like get other thoughts, but it's a spiritual calling. Yeah. Cause he's already defined it. Yeah. And it's already laid out. And I think sometimes we make that more difficult than it is. Yeah. Uh, we want more details, if that makes sense. But, yeah. um, and I think everything is really kind of in the spiritual realm. You know, these are spiritual blessings. Obviously, they're not physical blessings. Um, the unit that the um, mystery is a spiritual mystery, right? It's right. God who's doing this with Jews and Gentiles, not it, it is physical people, but. It's, it's this physical unity. Him, he brings it. He does it, yeah. The gospel is what unites us. Not It's not a physical unity. And I love, you said something. Uh, it must have been in, um, when we were discussing chapter two, and he goes into that, again, that whole section on one body kind of thing, which he echoes, again, here. Okay. In chapter mm -hmm. two, he starts it, right? Right. And you said, this is not uniformity. This is mm -hmm. unity. And that stuck in my head. I remember that. I was like, oh, that yeah. is so good because we are different. And now he's about to talk about our differences, right? He's going to give us distinctions and uniqueness. And yeah. so I wrote down what you said again, but watch, see, isn't that curious? Paul's like thought, right? He's talking to the Ephesians and then it's like, oh, by the way, this is Jews and Gentiles. Oh, by the way, chapter three, that's the mystery that I was given, that I revealed to you that you need to now walk in. Oh, by the way, chapter four, um, yeah, that unity is really important. One spirit, one Lord, one baptism, blah, 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 blah. And then by the way, you have distinctions, right? I was like, that's what Melissa said in chapter <laughs> two. It's unif It's not uniformity. It's unity, which we can't even do. We're supposed to just maintain it. It's a spiritual sense. So right. I think we're, we're just supposed to keep it, not create it. Yeah, we can't. And we yeah. can't get the spiritual blessings. We can't get that spiritual unity. Like everything kind of operates above on this spiritual realm that we just have access to which a little bit takes the pressure off because these aren't like physical manifestations these are spiritual things that we have access to so anyway mm -hmm. i remember what you said too i thought that was okay. a great connection i like um to that um he's like hey remember you know i beseech you a lot and it's kind of like remember you're all the same now remember they're all different <laughs> yeah yeah you're all the same it's like, okay because you're all called to different functions yeah um and different you know you're all vital to god's purpose in his design for you um in your differences so i don't know i struggled a lot with we must let's all not a robot thing but you know we should have all the same gifts but it's so much more freeing to say I don't have that gift. I can't meet my child's every need because I don't have all the spiritual gifts. I'm not Jesus. So, but my friend can maybe have a different gift than I do and they can see those gifts in action through the church, you know? Yeah. And through other believers. So it's, it is, it does take all pressure off. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, I wrote down just based on that first line, like walk in a manner worthy. Mm -hmm. I said um, the calling I just picked three things out that I was like, these are the, you know, because he obviously you can't rewrite down everything he said in one through in the chapter one, but I was like, you know, you're chosen to be holy and blameless, which mm -hmm. that concept holy and blameless has popped up again in two. And it popped up again in this one um, about, you know, because we're, we're not blameless, right? We're blameless in Christ. It's his merit. And then, you know, you're predestined to the praise of his glory. So you know, you're chosen to be holy and blameless to the praise of his gl glory for the good works that Ephesians 2.10 talked about right. here beforehand for you to do. So I thought if you had to kind of like, what's that calling? Well, it's to be holy and blameless. It's to bring him glory and it's to do the good works. And obviously four is going to elaborate on a lot of the, a lot of things that end up being, you know, good works that go back that, that bring him glory, that help you walk in that 
what he's put out for you. All right. Um, did you have any kind of an outline, a working outline that you wrote out with all the verses? I kind of did. Uh, um, so uh, one through six, um, I put live worthy or walk worthy. Um, yeah. And then same. I had a, uh, let's see, I had a lot on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm trying to remember my i'm sitting there looking at my second one uh, living the new life um is the end 17 through 32. Yeah. uh what did i put seven did you do seven through ten sidebar question mark <laughs> right, yeah right i'm like uh we're gonna supposed to live about that i think it was like unity or something about the church yeah um yeah, because I just kept, I think I skipped it. And uh, I mean, not skipped it, but I kept going on all the different words and I got into what's prophet and evangelist and pastor and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. Um, oh, maturity. That's what I said. Maturity in the church. Good. That's what I said. Growing a mature church, 11 through 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I did 17 through 32. I kind of yeah. labeled that like out with the old and with the new. So, you know, kind of same as you living it out. And then I mm -hmm. have um, chapter four, seven through 10 as kind of like a, um, it's its own little afterthought, right? It's like a, so we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll go over that specific section in a All little right. bit. Because he switches to Moses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a little bit like, um, what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about uh, after walking in a worthy, he gives us some ways that we do that. Did you say you looked up any of those words like humility, gentleness, patience? Or uh, yeah, um, let's see. We talk about calling. I have, you know, it's a call to persevere in faith, um, focus on Christ, and a call to our salvation, not because it comes from heaven and leads back to heaven, you know? Yes. Uh, and then um humble and loneliness um is that the first that's the first one i wrote humble humility or lowliness I yeah. I anyway um said our correct understanding of who we are in christ um and then i you know i kind of write myself and then i kind of like kind of just start writing um but i was thinking how our motivation our attitude towards god will affect how we communicate and act you know yes um our motivation is grace it's not you know i've thought about when you have little kids um you want to just obey you just because you said yeah I mean, we had yep. a we had a thing in parenting where you know we wanted them to obey first call <laughs> um, and a lot of that was safety reasons if i if they're running the street and i said stop i wanted them to stop you know yeah um and then as I got older, though, I wanted them to obey based off, off what they knew about our character and yeah. based off <laughs> preach, right? <laughs> Sorry, teenagers, super fun. Um, so you same thing with our Christian walk. I, um, as we get to know the heart of our father and Jesus and, you know, our, my attitude towards God, well, that will always affect my motivation, you know? Um, and the correct understanding that we're sub we're in submission to him, not the other way around. Right. Um, I put okay. on the, that thing that you're saying, I put, we don't walk worthy so that God will love us, but mm -hmm. because he already does. Our motivation stems from gratitude. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that um, something I was reading today talked about uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart, which is the exact same words mm -hmm. that, Paul, that Paul uses. Humility and gentleness. It's the same thing that Jesus says he is. So basically we're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling because we follow Jesus' steps. Right. We did it first and we do it. Not that it's easy to do. And I think that's why, why we keep saying all these things. We do this because... He loves us. We're, we're constrained to obedience out of love, not out of duty or whatever. Because um, as you and I joked about earlier, none of us are going to be perfect in this. That's why it's so important that you have one through three down 
first before you try to live this out. Because if any of us tries to look at our life and judge, or I'll just speak for myself. If I look at my life and I try to judge how good of a follower of Jesus I am based on how I'm walking out my calling, mm -hmm. it would be pretty sad and miserable. Well, and then you're also going to judge other people by how you think they're walking out their calling. And then you just become cynical and, yeah. and none of none of these long suffering things. No. <laughs> no. 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 You know, that's what I'm saying. It affects how I communicate and how I treat others all based on understanding my right standing with God. Yeah. That is based on grace. And so, honestly, if we were able to do it perfectly, we wouldn't really need Jesus. Like it's right. that whole like continual need to be poor in spirit and relying on Jesus to kind of help you. And our failing when, when handled correctly leads to confession. Confession is an act of righteousness, mm -hmm. putting ourselves at right, you know, falling at his feet again and doing it. It isn't like a, you know, we have to one time you never have to do it again. Right. Yeah. We're not going to walk worthy. Um, right. So we just continue to, you know, rely on him too do this for you. Yep. Right. All right. Uh, let's jump down to um, three through six, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all. So uh, just in general, any, any specific thoughts on that? Um, all the ones. Um, let's see. You to maintain the unity of the spirit. Well, I, was, um, I think I, I was just, again, wrote the every effort. Um, I liked that, that you were you eager to maintain it. So, you know, there's every effort to maintain it. Um, yeah. And enthusiasm and diligence. And it really, it builds your faith as well um, yeah. to do that. And then um, unity, again, I wrote down, it's a oneness, but not an organization or denomination. It's a loyalty to Christ as the unity. Yeah. For, and then um, all from the spirit, you know, of the spirit, but the bond of peace, I did, um, right before our one, all the ones, but um, that we, we endeavor to keep it, but we don't create it like we were just saying. Mm -hmm. So, cause I'm like, oh, how are we all going to do one Lord? How are we all going to do one for that? You know, like, I, I just want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And it's already done. Yeah. And I so, think what, what we were saying at the very first time we met about Ephesians and Ephesus in general, that mm -hmm. there, there is really a need to say one Lord, you know, you got the temple of Diana, you got them worshiping and we're going to see Roman it. and Greek. Yeah. Everybody is we're gonna see it come up in a second when he talks about what the Gentiles do right around them. Right. So he's like, you're not to do that. So they're surrounded by division with the Jews and Gentiles. Paul's in prison because of the divisiveness of preaching to the Gentiles. The Jews didn't like it. So, you know, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, one body, one, it, it's an echoing again of the gospel teaching and the mystery that the Jews and Gentiles are to be one. I think to mm -hmm. us, we're looking at this going, well, we are one body. Does he mean something else? No. Mm -hmm. no it's the same thing these are jews and gentiles one body one spirit you know there, there was multiple teachings of spirits and he's like yeah. no 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 there's one spirit there's mm -hmm. one lord there's one hope there's not multiple ways i mean even today you've got i mean you you've even got evangelical teachers teaching the pope oh well, jesus isn't the only way like as you know you've got all these different ways to god you know, Buddha, and anytime you do it, there's all these different ideas and, and people promoting certain pathways to enlightenment or pathways this. And here's Paul going, uh-uh, no, one hope, one way, one calling, one spirit, one Lord, one body, one one faith, one baptism, one God. Like that's it, that's it. Like, and it's like the redundancy is necessary for the Ephesian church to really get it. Everything you think is going on, all the competing factors, get rid of them. There's one in all of it. Right. So. And that is their culture is very competitive in their gods, you know, yes. and in their, so disunity, that's a great tool of Satan still today is disunity. I mean, if he can get us attacking um, and having our own, whatever we're worshiping, 
you know, yeah. in our own ideas of God's, um, God's standards and he's got, you know, that, yeah. that way we lose power. Yeah. So. Great. All right. You ready to talk about seven to 10? Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> So obviously what we already kind of set this up. So he's going to talk about, yeah, you're, you're unified, but you're, you're not uniform. You've got all kinds of distinctions and he's about to go introduce these distinctions. It almost seems to me, and I, and I read this somewhere else and I, I was already thinking it. So it made sense to me that it's like he pauses after verse seven and mm -hmm. realizes that he's going to kind of clarify a different point within a point and, and, you know, draw back from Psalm 68 from what, from talking about what David, you know, was, was saying in his own context in Psalm 68 and take it to apply here. Um, right. And then he kind of jumps back in, right? Because verse 11 and verse seven could go right together. Eight through 10 seem like a sidebar. You know what I'm saying? But if you, if you just, like he's like, that reminds me of a song. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Because if you just took out eight to 10, it would read perfectly, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangel. Like you, it would read perfectly. Mm -hmm. so it definitely, he definitely kind of has a thought pop in that he's going to kind of bring in and teach a little bit of a sidebar. So I think what, it was one of the early hymns, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah. And if you noticed, it was different than Psalm 68. Yeah, it really was. Paul quotes it differently, which I think is really interesting. So I'm gonna, let me jump back and read uh, Psalm 68. Um, so I think I'm pretty sure this is David. Yeah, it's a song of David. It mm -hmm. is a song, right? So, uh, they're singing it. Um, uh, yeah, let me read from 15. That'll kind of put it in context. It's all about, uh, what the almighty can do, the power of God, uh, what he does to armies. They flee before him. The women at home divide the spoil. We come to 15. This is what it says. Psalm 68, 15 through 18 says, Oh, mountain of God, mountain of, uh, Bashan, O oh, many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O oh, many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. Verse 18 You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. So that's interesting. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men. And then we come to our Ephesians 4, and this is how he quotes it. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Right. So obviously, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul is kind of um, using that imagery from Psalm 68, but here he's saying he gave gifts to men. Right. So I thought that was interesting that mm -hmm. there's a distinction. Um, what do you, what are you thinking on it? Yeah, I, th I thought he changed the, the subject, <laughs> you know, to understand that it was about Jesus and this is what, that he gave it instead of, I don't know. And like you said, the only way he would know that is probably it, obviously the, the holy spirit well and it's a transition too because david is the one being talked to right so he's talking about god from david's perspective but this is about something different from jesus perspective right so right yeah and death so before death had was not taken captive yet right you know, and now it is um and anyway did David oh. see that? Yes. I mean, you know, so it's pretty cool. Right. Um, this leads a little bit into kind of a crazy, there's a couple theories about this. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we could talk about them just for some explanations. So one theory keeps it real simple uh, that this is actually talking about uh, not his ascension, but his resurrection. Um, just that when he died, his spirit obviously descended. Uh, where did his spirit go? That's why I mentioned Hades. Um, right. And so we'll have to kind of, uh, what we need to talk through, I think that the idea of Hades, uh, where it comes from, 
why it's necessary. So I've written down a bunch of cross references. Um, but bottom line, some people think this is about his ascension, that when he ascended, so uh, he dies three days later, he's resurrected. And then he spends 40 days, right, appearing to people to over 500 plus the apostles and the women and 500 people at one time, I think, is what it says in Matthew. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, the <laughs> yes. And then he ascends. So some people think this is when he ascends, he led a host of captives, that that's more just, um, what's the word? Metaphorical, allegorical. Uh, right. You know, just not that he actually led like. They weren't really captives. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But that okay. at that point, he gave gifts to men. Now that could be, I think after he leaves, uh, soon after Pentecost happens and the Holy Spirit is given. So right. the Holy Spirit's the one that gives us the gifts or, or encompasses it as we have him, we dwell, he dwells in us and we, you know, receive our gifts through, from Christ, through the Spirit, so that the Spirit really is what he's referring to here, that he gave the Spirit. He promised them, I think in, I didn't yeah. write that down. That's true. Yeah. But he Where promised them the apostles. I'll go for it, but I'm leaving someone yeah. better basically yeah. <laughs> the spirit will be with you yeah so that in verse 9 and 10 when he clarifies by that parenthetical statement in saying he ascended what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions that this could be two things that either it's meaning he descended meaning he came to earth and then he ascended or that he descended meaning he died and he ascended meaning he resurrected so what are the low earthly regions okay so My, uh, well, there, so when I read about the one saying that this just means he came down as a human, um, it did not even talk about that. And that bothered me. I was like, well, wait a minute. Why would it specify not just came to earth, right? but went to the lower regions, um, which is why I tend to go with the second one that I believe this is more about his death, that he descended. And right. then he, this is talking about, he ascended, meaning he came up out of the depths of the earth, meaning he resurrected. Right. Um, and I'll tell you another reason I I think that too, looking ahead is his audience would understand. I think they would understand that it was the place of the dead. Yeah. So that's under, and then later when he skipping ahead a little, and he talks about putting, taking off and putting on, you're taking off something, grave clothes, which are so repulsive to Jews, you know, they do not touch grave clothes. So it, that flows better for me, you know, that his, he's like, just knowing how Paul goes back and forth and, you know, yep. stays with the theme. Um, so I think they would understand that more the lowly places to mean the place of the dead. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, so the word in Hebrew is, and so if you're going to hear David, if you're going to read about it in the Psalms, you, you're probably going to think about it more as Sheol, which mm -hmm. is the Hebrew concept of that place, this, this uh, place of the dead. Um, I think it's interesting because in our world today, um, Hades is a very common term because of Greek mythology, right? Mm -hmm. And so because most Christians would probably go, oh, Greek mythology is not real. So Hades is not a real place, but actually it's talked about a lot in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to read a couple of passages just to kind of put in perspective what I think is happening here. And I will clarify uh, that there are a couple different interpretations and I'll give mine and you can kind of give yours and we'll kind of talk through what we think is going on. Um, in Acts chapter two, um, we read in verse, uh, let me read in verse 22 down through verse 33. Because this is all going to kind of uh, play a part with this. So it says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. 
being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God did raise up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one passage about Hades with David foreseeing, uh, not him, not himself, because David Paul is saying, obviously that's not talking about David. He's not talking about himself because he did rot. His body did right. decay. Jesus yes. didn't. He went into Hades, but God Hades. raised him up. Right. So from that, we go, okay, hang on a second. If, if Jesus, when he died, goes into Hades, why and what's going on? So uh, do you want to take this or me first? Which one? Uh, you want to talk about the idea of Old Testament saints and Hades? Oh, you go ahead. I don't know where you're going. Okay. okay. So <laughs> I didn't know if you like already had it in your mind, like a way you want to go. So this is what I, I we, we, we talk about this with our FX kids a lot because they have a lot of questions because we study uh, Luke chapter 16, yeah. uh, the idea of the rich man and Lazarus, where when they both die. Oh, they, oh, oh. yeah, we've talked about this. Um, and it's, and you can read Luke 16. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you guys. You can go look it up and read Luke 16. Right. Um, some people think it's just a parable. I, I personally do not. I think it's more than that because he names names. Normally in parables, Jesus doesn't name any names, but he calls the guy Lazarus. Bottom line, he goes down into Hades. They both die. The rich man dies. Lazarus dies. They knew each other. The rich man walks by Lazarus every day, doesn't help him, doesn't offer him, you know, whatever. They both find themselves in Hades, but they're in different compartments. Mm -hmm. So Lazarus is being comforted by Abraham. It's called Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man is in torment. There's a great chasm that separates both sides. Um, and the bottom line is the rich man um, can talk over the chasm and begs Abraham to go back and tell his brothers about it so they won't find themselves in the same spot. And Abraham's like, why would I do that? They have Moses and the prophets. Uh, they know they, they know what you know is going on. So we, we, we kind of get this idea from this parable that uh, the Old Testament saints, Jesus had not died on the cross yet. So um, a, 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 there's a very pretty popular theory out there that um, the Old Testament saints, while they are saved the exact same way we are through faith, they are looking forward to the cross. We are putting faith backward in history. They're putting it forward in the future that they were not able to enter heaven and even says actually in Acts, it actually says for David did not ascend into the heavens. So when David died, he is in Hades in the same place that you're going to find like Joshua, Moses, Abraham, and all these people that are believers. They have put their faith, but they just, the blood has not been paid yet. So when Jesus looks at the thief on the cross and the thief says to him, remember me. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? So what would be happening is that thief is going to be with Jesus. And when he resurrects out of the grave, if you remember in Matthew, I should have written it down. I think it's Matthew 28. But it says that when Jesus resurrected, tombs broke open. Right. And bodies of the dead came Walking out. Around. It says in verse 20, in chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 52. <laughs> actually, let me uh, go back to verse 51. It says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. So this is happening right when Jesus dies. He gives up his spirit. Curtain is torn, rocks split, earth shakes, right? The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, but, but check it out, the timing, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection. So the earth, the earthquake happens, the rocks are split, the tombs are broken open, but they don't come out until after because Christ is the firstborn. He's the first fruits. He rises first. So right. Jesus raises from the dead and all of a sudden, the bodies of the saints, they come out of the tombs and appear to many people. Where are they going? And They're going with Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus at his resurrection ascends. He's leading the host of captives. So imagine this. So if there's two compartments in Hades, and Old Testament saints are waiting for the day that Christ's blood atones for their sins and allows them interest to heaven. Jesus raises from the dead. He goes down into Hades. In his spirit, right? He preaches victory over the disobedient saints. We see that in 1 Peter 3 and 4. 
And then he opens the gates. Isaiah prophesies about this. Isaiah 61. What is what did he come to do? He came to set the captives free. He came to break open, to loose the bonds of captivity and break them open. So if all of that is happening, just imagine when he comes out of the grave, he's leading victoriously like a like a military general. He's leading all these people that have been captive in Hades. They're not in torment. They're under a blessing. They're being comforted. Mm -hmm. But they're not in heaven with Christ, and they want to be. And so he leads them home. And when he does it, by the way, he gives a gift of all these spiritual gifts. So now you're going to get the Holy Spirit's going to come. So these people are going to get to go to heaven. You know, they, they're going to actually, you know, after they appear, they're on the way. And so I kind of think that's that's my theory of that is like, this is just a little glimpse of a concept we see all over. We see it in Isaiah, we see it in Luke 4, which is a repeat of the Isaiah prophecy. We see it in 1 Peter 3 and 4. We see it in Acts 2, this idea that there is a place called Hades. But I do believe that that one compartment has been emptied. And so that now when a believer dies, and ever since Jesus has been in heaven, when you close your eyes on this earth, I believe you open your eyes in the presence of the Lord. You don't have to go to a temporary waiting place anymore. And by the way, Revelations talks about Hades too, how at one point God is gonna call up everybody else that has in that is waiting for judgment in Hades. And will one day they will come forward out of Hades. It says uh, the sea, the death and Hades gave up their dead. And they're mm -hmm. gonna come forth judgment at that point. And there's gonna be no more Hades and they'll be put into the final destination which will be the lake of fire, which is Gehenna, totally different place. Uh, exactly. eternal resting place for uh, those that are disobedient rejected you know right. and second people. Thessalonians echoes that as well you know those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds and, you know it's like encourage one, one another You're, you'll always be with the Lord you know right and so I you know that is consistent I, I believed as well through scripture yeah and how yeah. like Satan you know I was thinking about um you're saying a lot of people don't believe because they think, oh, Hades, that's, you know, I saw that on Hercules. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and so that's got to be made up. But what is Satan, the great imitator of light? And so all he wants to do is deceive. And this is huge to him. Like death, that's it. That's all he had is death, which is, is, is big. And so the fact that Jesus is victorious over death, I mean, Oh, that stings, you know, so <laughs> all it's like we won the war. He just has these little uh, battles here and there. And so if he can get us not to even believe in the power of that and how amazing that is and take away from how powerful that is and how, I don't know, just how beautiful that is. Yep. That's, that's a win for him. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. All right. Anything else on seven through 10 you want to add? No, well, there. I didn't see another commentary. I think it was this too about ascended. It had something with Moses. Is this where it was about Moses and the going up to Mount Sinai? No, I've heard it. I've heard that. Yeah, it, and so they were talking about the same way that God took Moses up. You know, on Mount Sinai, He also took Jesus with Him, which I thought was a, a beautiful thing too. You know, instead yeah. of. Well, you come to me. It's kind of like, no, God brought him up. Which, yeah. I don't know. It was just a sweet thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So if we connect back up to verse seven, mm -hmm. and, and we, that, we, we've dealt with the sidebar eight to 10. So back up to verse <laughs> seven. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift down to 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we attain, all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children <laughs> tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by every human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Let's talk about that little section right there. So 11 through 15. Yeah. Um, like I said, I kind of looked at the different uh, roles, I guess, uh, that were mentioned just because I, I guess I hadn't really thought about it too much. Yeah, uh, yeah talk about those. That's great. So, um, you know, he, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Um, 
and I was saying, you know, apostles that those are those who were sent with authority, you know, and he's already talked about how he's an apostle of Christ as well. You know, he'll call himself one, what is it, abnormally born or, abnormal, <laughs> you yeah. know, in other words, because he can, his conversion came at what the resurrected Christ appeared yeah, to him. Yeah. Um, and then I think now we would, um, I was reading one and said, those are the people who are in general leadership. I was like, I just don't think about my elders as apostles, but okay, okay. So <laughs> it's there. It got to make sense. Yeah. And then uh, prophets, um, I think, um, you know, the, the, it means to speak forth. So making, uh, proclaiming the word of God in a way that is clear and that causes people to act. Right. So um, not like the prophets of old, they, again, they, <laughs> they didn't have Christ, you know, we, um, we have the full picture, I guess, or I don't know how to say that, but, um, so that just kind of making better known the good news or the word of God. Yeah. Really um, the good one. We do get caught up just thinking of this gift as the foretelling, like telling the mm -hmm. future, but what you said, I, I like that. It, it's also just forth telling, even if you were to read the prophets, some of the things they said were not foretelling. It was just literally foretelling in that moment. This will happen if you do this, right? right? It, it, they, and, and had already been told that it was already clear. God already said, I'll do this if you do this. And they were simply repeating it. Like, right. I want to remind you of what God said. If you do this, right. you will do this. And I feel like that's what, you know, Still. Mm -hmm. we, we do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we walk in that giftedness sometime. You, you and I both, like we, we walk in this gift of forth telling. I'm going to tell you what the truth is. Sure. When you walk in that, there, there is, there's an element of that, of just prophetic speech. I'm just forth telling. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen based on what God had already said. I'm going to repeat what God said. I'll tell right. you again what's going to happen. Yeah, I'm not adding to, to it, hopefully. No. I'm not <laughs> I'm just, fixing anything. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. Just telling you. Yeah. Um, and then, um, let's see, evangelists, um, uh, proclaiming good news, you know, and they typically are to unbelievers Yeah. where I feel like, I wonder, I don't know how you feel about this. I feel like with the gift of prophecy now, um, I know I do, do not use that on unbelievers because I don't, they don't understand it. You know what I mean? So why, I don't know, to me, that's evangelism. Right. That's my husband, <laughs> even though he would probably not like me saying that. Um, but it is, he is, he could easily be a street preacher. So I am more of a, um, once you have an understanding, you know, forth telling, making right. it clear. Um, so I thought that was interesting that he differentiates the two. Um, pastors, he would typically think of as shepherds, as, and they would understand that. Um, and then teachers um, or instructors. And so that's all I had on that. And the, the whole thing is to equip or to make perfect. Um, and the word equipping, um, uh, one thing I, I saw and it said making a complete fit as in mending fishing nets i saw that or setting broken bones setting broken bones i do that <laughs> i loved it it was like to put it right like and I, I love this because you know whether you get into the spiritual gifts in romans 12 or first corinthians 12 uh, this is what it is for we tend to sometimes think about um Okay, I'll say it, but we're not, we don't have to go into it. But, you know, some people might talk about having like, I speak in tongues, but I only do it at my house by myself. And it's, it's a prayer language. Yeah. And I kind of, sometimes I go back to this and I go, but, but what's the goal? The goal of the spiritual gifts, you were giving them to equip the body, mm -hmm. right? So these are used for the body to, to raise it up into this beautiful thing, which again, I love this. If you go back and look at Ephesians two and three, he's already established this concept of the body of Christ. Uh, we're all that, you, what would you say? It was Ephesians two, right? Where it said, um, mm -hmm. we're being grown up into like a beautiful dwelling place. Right. You know, and he's going to talk about that. Yeah. That again, 221. He talks about that. 
Yeah, and the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in whom you also are being built together. So I love it. Again, you can just see Paul's flow of thought. Like he's already mm-hmm. established this idea of the body and the working together. And then he, it comes up again here. Right. He's already said, you know, so I, I like that. Um, and people and do ask, have to be right. trained to know where they fit. Don't you yes. think? I mean, I, I wish it was like, and here you are, you know, kind of like the movies, you know, like your sadness, you're this, you know, <laughs> you're it's automatically not an exhaustive list. You, you, yeah. even if you took all three lists, Romans 12, first Corinthians and this, it's not exhausted. Mm-hmm. You know, th- these are just like a template. There's probably more. Mm-hmm. So I did like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like to, I thought about if you don't grow, cause that was the whole goal, like to equip the body to bring you into full maturity, completion, perfection, blah, 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 kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And if, but I kept thinking, if you don't, then 14 happens, verse 14 happens, right? And also Correct. you're going to be that, the people in Hebrews four, where he says, you should be teachers by now, but you're right. not. Instead, you're still drinking the milk. You should be eating solid food, but you're not, you're not ready for what I'm about to give you. And I need to give it to you. So I need you to get ready. So in Ephesians, you can hear this author, you know, Paul is putting a, a pronunciation on that. Like we got to get the, these people to grow. We got to get this body to grow, right? We need them to mature so that, you know, we can get by. And then of course, you know, verse 14 to me is like the ultimate negative. If you don't grow, you're going to get tossed around. You're going to believe anything that comes your way, you know, just being able to discern. That's the big Mm -hmm. thing. You want to be able to discern truth. And I think, didn't he, does he say that? Yeah. Not be tossed to and from by human cunning. Uh, every wind of doctrine by human cunning and by craftiness and schemes. So some of it, yeah, I thought that was, it kind of escalates yeah. knowledge, you know, and I thought about that too. Do I get um, carried away? I do go down rabbit holes easily with lots of things. And so, <laughs> because I'm a knowledge, you know, so um yeah, every wind of doctrine, I'm like, well, what is that? What, what, why do they think that? Well, let me go look and see why. I, it's like, I want to understand their point of view and some, but that can be so dangerous um, without a good foundation. And, um, but not only that, but the, the cunning and the craftiness, that really is not knowledge based. That, that's playing on my emotions. Yeah. You know, that's playing on which my heart. Yeah. So, both of those things were like, you've got to guard your, which we're going to obviously get into in six, um, <laughs> but your heart and your, and your mind. Yes. I, I thought, I don't know. I thought that I'm glad he included both things. Yeah. Um, I also love what you put um, on the Facebook page. And so uh, <laughs> for the women that are on email, not Facebook page, if you'll uh, go over that real quick that you took off of like if the, the verse 15. Oh, yeah. So when did I have it? Hang on. I messed up and started taking notes on um, Sunday morning in the middle of my Ephesian notes and it was not a good idea. Okay. So I'm like, to the church of Sia. La, la, la. No. Okay. Maybe. All right. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if y'all can see that because I don't know what's happening. But anyway. Up a little bit and tilt forward. Uh, uh. Like tilt it down. So it's like. Like other, that? No, other, other way. Down? Yeah, now come closer. Mm-hmm. Up a little bit. Perfect. Hey. Let me hey. let me call that out. So it says like she's got the truth arrow on the side pointing up, love on the down, and then she's got a box of four critic, developer, antagonist, enabler. What yes. are you thinking? So um, so it's like a graph. So if that antagonist corner where you're low in love and low in truth. So if you're speaking, like what are you speaking? Um, because it, it says here, rather speak speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way, okay, into him. So in my relationships with other people and my relationship with my children, my workplace, um, you know, we all <laughs> can be any of those four corners, right? So a lot of love and low on truth um is an enabler. Let's go. Um, obviously we want to be the developer, right? We want to be developing, especially as you think about discipling, that kind of thing. Um, um, another, it's just good heart check for me. It, am I low on love for this person? I, I just want to be right. Cause I'm high on truth. I got it. I know this, I know they're wrong. 
and I don't care if I crush them. Well, that's a critic. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just really, it, I liked that little graphic. Just, you know, I don't know. I always ask myself, what are you speaking? Are you speaking as an enabler? Are you speaking as a critic? Or uh, are you just trying to pick a fight? Or um, are you really trying to develop? So it is a balance and it's hard. Um, so I just, you know, like I said, I, we I pray for wisdom and all of that um, and how to do it. I'm going to read uh, what Melissa posted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it necessary? Yeah. Necessary what, truth what in time? Say that again. Is it, is this necessary? Is it true? Is it uh, and is it kind? Love mm -hmm. it. I thought both of those were so good. She said something I mm -hmm. always say to my kids. Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it true? And that's mm -hmm. so good. So good. Yeah. That is. Good. I'm trying to draw that chart. <laughs> Wait a minute. I liked it. Okay. All right, good. Uh, let's keep going. Um, mm -hmm. So we are moving on to uh, verse 17 through 32. This is kind of one big section. And by the way, um, in your notes, I mentioned that when you see an instruction to put like an eye out in your margin and maybe circle it, there were um, from 17 down to 32, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 specific instructions that he gives us. So this one's heavy on the behavior chart. Um, and I love that he starts off with, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must not longer, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensu sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So talking about that first. Debauchery. Yeah, I know, right? Licentiousness. I had to look it up. I was like, ooh, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. I um, remember that being said from the pulpit, but I didn't know what they meant. I was like, what's the bar tree? Yeah, we know. I'm going to read a couple of uh, cross references. So I'm going to read uh, Romans 8 7, because I want to talk about this idea of uh, the futility of their minds, um, darkened in their understanding. Um, I wrote down Romans 8 5 that's funny yeah right exactly so I'll actually read 5 through 7 so it says uh Romans this is Romans 8 5 through 7 for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on life uh, on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So this is that idea of darkened in their understanding, like incapable because of the hardness of their heart. And that idea of being calloused um, is actually a medical term. And the hardness, the idea of callous is used when a callus forms, when a bone is fractured. Such a callus is harder. It becomes harder than the bone itself in right. medical terms. Um, so the, these people are not just by the way, your typical like atheists who are still maybe trying to live within morality. Maybe they have a value system. Um, the language here, they give have given themselves up to debauchery, like you said, sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The, um, the Greek kind of meaning behind that word is that they're not trying to hide it. They're doing it openly, publicly, and not just that, but they're flaunting it in the face of those. So when he's saying this, obviously, again, we talked about Ephesus, the temple of Diana, idolatry everywhere, uh, orgies being um, pitched as spiritual, you know, right. come, come participate in the spiritual enlightenment this activity. That's just really an orgy. So, you know, lots of stuff to think about. And then I wanted to read one more, although I will say Ephesians 2 already set this up you're dead in your sins in which you walk you're following the course of the prince of the power of the air so you know you it's it's already set up in ephesians that these are these people are dead in their sins dead in their trespasses right you need mm -hmm. god to show you mercy and make you alive to get out of that kind of a scenario uh second corinthians 4 
four through six. Um, just to save time, I'm going to summarize. Yeah. Um, it talks about just the God of this world referring, it's a lowercase g, mm -hmm. uh, referring to Satan. He has blinded their minds, keeping them in ignorance. It says the gospel is veiled because in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Again, you would need an intervention from the spirit of God in order to come out of this. You would need to be transferred from the domain of darkness into the domain of the kingdom of, of, of God. Right. And then first, okay. go ahead. No, no, go. Um, the, the live as the Gentiles do, you know, um, it's just purposeless, I put it purposeless. They have no purpose, um, uncaring and selfish. And it's um, like you were kind of saying the callousness, they refuse to be convicted, you know? Um, so you reject, it is a rejection of God already. And things that used things that used to shock them doesn't shock them anymore. Right. And I mean that's true for all of us. Um, yeah, the, you're right. Happen. This is the process. They have become callous. Yeah. It's a choice they've made, you know, through the hardening of their own heart to continue to harden it. They're just strengthening. Yeah. He says they heart. did it. He didn't do it. You know, right. there's other times where God's like, I hardened his heart. He's like, Well, they became callous and then right. they gave themselves over to this. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love it. A desire for more and more is yeah. another version. I thought that is so true. Um, and then I always like to, I guess, um, like why? Why would this be? Why these? You know, why this list? Mm -hmm. Why is this a different list? Because um, there's lots of lists of, you know, these things I hate, these things, you know. Sure. Um, but uh, it just takes over your lives. Mm -hmm. And it, it's lonely. You know, you think because he he talks about that. It's it just leads to a life of just dysfunction, loneliness, and I said and hurt, yeah. and then hurt people, hurt people. You know, so, um, and I thought of that um, song. He is jealous for me. It came in my head, and I thought, yeah, he is jealous for it. like you know I'm talking about godly jealousy. Like your mind, don't hurt my people. Don't you know? Yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, that's what it was. Just different. Uh, last cross reference, and then we'll move on. Mm -hmm. um, First Corinthians chapter two, when Paul is talking about um, receiving wisdom from the Spirit, and he's explaining to them, you know, that that basically in verse ten he says these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So God's the one that imparts wisdom. Okay, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. For the spirit who is from God that we might understand these things and we impart these things in truth that are spiritual and then verse 14 really clarifies the contrast we have received that right we have the spirit who imparts this wisdom to us because he's the one that knows the wisdom of God but in verse 14 it says the natural person which then word natural would be in the flesh again same concept that Romans is talking about same concept we're getting here the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned, which again goes full circle <laughs> to what we talked about in the beginning. These are spiritual things. You know, yeah. this is a spiritual realm that I just can't help it but go, man, you can't access this without the intervention and the mercy of God. Absolutely. But God, you were this way, you walked this way, but God, because of his great mercy with which he loved us with, made us alive together with Christ. I just keep thinking about that. And then I love 20, well, he, he lists that, but this is not the way you learned Christ, right? Assuming that you have heard about him, which is hilarious. Don't tell me Paul's not ironic. Assuming you have heard he was there for years teaching them. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, assuming you, assuming that you have heard about him, that I told you, you know, I just, I'm like, have you heard anything I've ever said? This is sarcasm. Just, yeah, I can't help it, but think that, but put off your old self, put on your new, right? Or assuming you've read the first part of my letter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So put off and put on. So let's just real quick run through this list because basically he comes down to it like the, the very end. He's just going to give you like, these are the things you should be doing. Like, yeah. Walk in. Something else you I've read too, though, um, where the therefore, you know, therefore having put yeah, it yeah. away, blah, blah, blah. It's not an imperative, but indicatives. Kind of like we were saying before. 
like so therefore you're not gonna do the you know you're just not gonna want to not that we're not gonna ever sin again but i thought that was an interesting take on it because instead of a another list of therefore this 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 and this which obviously it is a very practical way of living out your day-to-day life as a uh, follower but uh, that it was an indicative of that you are belong to christ because you walk in this way yeah 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 i love the put off your old self put on your new um i, I wrote down that 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 put on is in the uh aorist middle tense meaning it's like a one it's like a snapshot it's a done mm-hmm. deal so basically he's like it's been done now walk in it like this right. is who you are like put on who you already are you, you are this right. now wear it like so the idea of clothing is cool you know you're putting off your old self we're called to die to that um but, but this is just another picture of justification versus mm-hmm. sanctification right justification it's the one-time thing you are saved from the penalty of sin but sanctification is the process it keeps on going right Right. So it's like this is this has been done. Now walk in it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought about that too. Again, this is kind of a mental choice. You know, you wake up every day with a choice. What, right. what am I wearing? What am I going to walk in? Am I going to pick up that old dead body and carry it around and wear that, or am I going to put that off every day? This is that again, positional holiness, practical holiness, positional holiness done deal. Bat, you know, the, the the war is over. The battle is won. Right. But on a daily basis, we face battles that we have to fight, right? The big battle's done. My soul is secure. But on a daily basis, I fight for my joy. I fight for my holiness. I fight to be blamed. I fight all that stuff is an ongoing battle. So put off the old self, put on the new, be renewed in the spirit of your minds, which I love. Again, renew mm-hmm. is Paul, again, going off that knowledge. You know, he prayed the prayer. I think it's in Ephesians 1. I pray that you would know. Hold on. Let me go back. Pray that Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope which he has called you. What are the riches of his and glorious inheritances and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us to believe? Knowledge. I mean, it, it's not to puff up, but it's necessary. Right. right. So this is about renew the spirit of your minds. Romans 12 too, right? Don't be, be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is what we're doing right now. Like what we do with Ephesians chapter one every day and then Ephesians chapter two and then three and then four. Th- mm-hmm. This is what we're doing. If you are participating in this reading plan, you are doing what he is saying. You are taking up and being active in that instruction to right. renew your mind, to take on that new self. Um, so yeah. And it means it's possible. <laughs> right, it's possible to have victory. Yes. Um, and the, again, uh, I don't know why, where I found this, and uh, but that, the taking up it's something about the grave clothes I, I don't know if it was yes. i love yeah. that so and that would just be so ugh, to accuse especially it, it should be ew to us right you know we've, we've but they looking. found that like that made them unclean yeah so you know they're you know that's that they had that impurity i love it yeah. yeah so be angry don't speak falsehood speak truth mm-hmm. with your neighbor Going, that, that reference is back to verse 15, speak truth and love. Be angry, mm-hmm. don't sin. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief not steal, but labor, doing honest work so we can have something to share. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you all good things. I don't mean to like hurry through those, but I just want to yeah, yeah. kind of close it out. I just kind of wrote that whole list again. Like what, what does my new man look like? And I just wrote the list down and right. some of it, you know, echoes back to the 10 commandments. Some of it's just these, you know, echoes back to the poor in spirit. Some of it, it's like, it's like a, a, you could like see this list kind of in anything you read in the new mm-hmm. Testament based on what it's like. When you're walking in holiness, walking in your calling. So, that's all right. Any last thoughts? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you know, then we get into um, um, kind of five is just a continuation, right? Like, therefore, be imitators of God. You know. Yep. 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 More, wa- more walking. More yeah. walking. 
I yeah. think it's in uh, next week um, begins Lent, uh, season yeah, Lent. Seventeenth. Mm hmm. On the, um, I like the church calendar girl. I'm a church calendar girl. So, um, uh, is going to be doing a Lent thing this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. You should be hearing about it this Sunday. Is it? So, I, when Lent comes up every year, um, and Lent for those who don't know is, um, this is a time leading up to Resurrection Sunday. So. 40 days, 48 days, really, if you count on Sundays. Um, <laughs> so, um, but usually I ask myself with it coming up, um, what do I need to put off or take off and what do I need to put on? You know, because some things it's more of what I need to put on versus taking off. Does that make sense? Um, so then when I was reading uh, Ephesians 4, I was like, got it, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of things I need to take off and just how to do that. And those are always my questions, my three questions. What do I need to put off? What do I need to put on? And how do I do that? Every year I ask him that and then pray, you know, through that. And so I thought, well, it's right there in Ephesians 4, Melissa, you know? Yeah. yeah. So right. it's good. I love it. Um, my big thing, I just uh, want to encourage people um, not to let this um, weigh you down. I go back to what I read earlier, you know, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, you know, where it says, come to me, all you who are uh, weary and heavy laden, and, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you from humble and holy heart and, you know, whatever, my burden is light, but I, I love the idea, like, if we start making this a law mm. that we have to keep in that sense, it will become a burden, and it's the exact thing, he didn't say, come to me, all you who are weary like i'm just tired because i didn't sleep well last night and jesus says come to me if you're weary no yeah. he's talking to people that are weary because of the law mm -hmm. like if you're weary because the the burden of keeping the law is too much come Good to day. me because mm -hmm. my, my yoke is is easy and my burden is light right so i think to myself there there's that tension and that balance we've talked about this before you and i mm -hmm. <laughs> You got to walk out that tension of like, this is not to be a law. We're to do this joyfully. And when you don't feel the joy, you got to like drop that before the Lord. Like you got to take that. Mm -hmm. to, why? Why? Why does this feeling like law? What's mm -hmm. my motivation? What's my thinking? What's my attitude? Because if it feels usually it's for me, it's usually because I'm not trusting him. I'm not trusting the heart of my father. I'm doing the exact what I complained about other people doing to me, um, but not when it becomes burdensome, I forget why, like, why would he, why wouldn't he want me to go have an orgy at the temple? That'd be super, whatever. Um, because it hurts and it isolates and it's bad for me and it's bad for others. And, um, just trust him in that, you know? And so again, it's why the obedience instead of the letter of the law, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, the last thing we want to do with Ephesians is you to forget one through three and forget right. that and make this a list right. of do's and don'ts. Right. So, um, yeah. So I just encourage, you know, I, I've been feeling it. You know, I feel the weight of it. I don't do this well mm -hmm. all the time. And so I, I feel heavy. I feel yeah, but conviction is good. It's good. If the sins listed, they ignored grace. Yeah. All those sins are ignoring grace because it's continuing and forgiveness. And, you know, so it's like, they're just like, so I think, um, yeah, I think conviction is good. <laughs> it's great. And it's meant to be a, uh, you know, a joyful process. It even says in James, confess your sins to one another. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to be hiding and, and, and trying to work out life alone. So yeah. find someone safe to keep you uh, this um community reading so that's all i've anything else that actually looks nope. like you frozen up oh i thought there you froze you up all right well thanks for joining us i hope you guys i hope this helped if you have any questions uh <laughs> are you back are you there I yes. think so. You were frozen. Okay. Oh, funny. I was frozen. You were frozen too. No, you were. That's funny. You both are frozen. Ah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa, for joining me Thank tonight. You. Do this. Thanks. See you guys. All right. Bye.